Today's scripture reading will be from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 through 8. For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed, in this house we groan longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. And as much as we have, or as much as we having put it on, will not be found naked. For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan being burdened, because we do not want mortal will be swallowed up by life. Now he, now he who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave to us the Spirit as a pledge. Therefore, being always of good courage, and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer, prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Last week, um, after our sermon, we discussed Romans chapter 5, and we went into chapter 6. I uh, had some questions that came up, and then... Uh, questions afterwards by people that came up to me and sort of threw me into a, a frenzy of thoughts, I guess, if you will, during the course of the week about things and sort of changed my direction for where I wanted to go this morning. And I have to tell you, I'll just confess to you that it's been a struggle for me this week to try to figure out how I want to present this lesson to you. You know, it'd be nice for me to, I, I don't want to lie to you and think that it just, these just magically pop in my head. They they don't. They take lots of time, prayer, study, and, and I'm grateful the elders allow me to be able to study that way. But sometimes the weight of the message is a, is a challenge. And uh, making sure that we can deliver that message in a way that is uh, strong, bold, like we talked about in our class this morning, uh, compassionate, uh, biblical mostly, of course. Uh, those things can sometimes be a challenge. But uh, I'm grateful for the men who have led us in worship this morning. I think each one of them have uh, said something. Charlie's led a couple songs, and uh, they've all sort of dovetailed into what I'd want to present to you this morning. As you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, as we just had read for us the first eight verses, it's in the midst of a in the midst of a, probably one of Paul's most passionate writings, uh, personal writings. And he, as, he ha as it happens in many places, he's uh, under attack, of course, his apostleship and his authority and things like that. And, and um, it's important to keep that into context. But as we just read in the first eight verses, Paul's talking, uh, giving to us, a picture of of the blessing of being in Christ, right? And that while we are here in in this body, and and the longer you live, the more you understand what he says about in this house uh, we groan, right? He he's talking about uh, the physical body and the fact that this physical body is what what houses our, our spirit, right? What houses our soul and. And this is our earthly tabernacle. It's where we live now. And, and man, every morning, the longer you live, the more you feel these things start to break and creak. And really, it's not even so much as much as we hate the, the physical pain and the breakdown of our body. But we also, we, we take on more and more the trouble of the world. And we, we just hear stuff all the time that's just, you know, after a while, after 30, 40, 50, 60, sometimes 90 you know, some years for some of you, you just you see it over and over and over, and it's like after a while, it's just please, Lord, please, just just let me be with you. I'm I'm tired of being in this earthly tent, and I I can't wait to be there with you. And so, we see some blessings um, that come from being in Christ, 
And that's what we've been wanting to, we've been discussing since the beginning of this this series about why baptism. You notice at the beginning in verse 5, he says that we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens for you. That's for children of God, isn't it? He gives some more blessings. He says that in verse 4, one day our mortal uh, will be swallowed up by life. Still talking about this eternal nature that we have. And notice in verse 5, He who prepared us for this very purpose is God. Notice the last part of the verse, Who gave to us what? The Holy Spirit. Your Bible may say pledge. The idea here is a, is a down payment. Now, I want you to think about that momentarily, that, that God would give the Holy Spirit as a down payment to show uh, his seriousness about the promise about this eternal home. That's, that's big, isn't it? I mean, that's, that's incredible to me. Can you, can you comprehend it? that the Holy Spirit would be given as a, as a down payment, as if God has to give a down payment to show me anything. But what he, what he did by great grace is he gave the Holy Spirit as a, as a guarantee, as a down payment of the fact that there's a place waiting for you. It's yours. Your name is on it. And you're going to be here. What a great blessing for those in Christ. Only those in Christ. It's, this isn't made for anybody else. We see some other blessings toward the middle of the chapter, actually toward the end. Notice, if anyone's in Christ, what is he? He's a new creature, right? The old things have passed away. And, and as you think about your life, many of us here who have put on Christ, right? We think about our life before Christ. Don't you look back with, with great shame and embarrassment? And, and aren't you glad that you can say, that's just not me anymore? I am a new creature. Why? Because God made me a new creature. I'm a new creation in His sight. Those old things, they're gone. Go on, verse 18. He says this, All these things are from God, who reconciled us to Himself through Christ. Look, if you've not obeyed the gospel yet, okay, you're in this number here, or you're watching on, on uh, YouTube or wherever it may be, Think about the idea of being reconciled to God. And we studied that last week in Romans chapter 5, right? It's there in Romans chapter 6. The idea of being reconciled is that there, there are some books and these books are out of whack and the balance is off. And if you're outside of Christ, you're standing in, in a way where, where you're in, in a bad way, okay? No matter how you look at the book, no matter what you put in there about how you live or what you do or how you do things, you're not reconciled to God. They're out of balance. And the only way that you can be reconciled to God is by putting on Christ in baptism. That's the only way. There is no other way. And thanks be to God for those of us here who have done this, as he says, who reconciled us to himself. How? Through Christ. You're not going to get to reconcile with God through Buddha or some Hindu god or any other thing that may present itself as, as someone important. There's only one path, right? There's only one path to be reconciled to God, to make sure your life is right with God, and that's Jesus Christ. And that, and that the words that he gives us in John 14, verse 6, I, I'm the way, right? And Christians, when you look through the book of Acts, sometimes they were referred to as those who followed what? This way or the way. We understand Christ is it. There's no other way. So just eliminate everything else. But if you want to be reconciled to God, it's going to be through Christ. Notice in verse 19 what he says, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. That I love to hear. Can you make a list of all your trespasses against God before you were reconciled to Him? I can't. Oh, I don't like that old Sean. I don't like who he was. And every time that a thought creeps in my mind of who I used to be, I have great shame. But I can look at this and say this, that the Lord took that away. And He's not holding those trespasses against me any longer. They're gone. 
But it's only in one place. It's in being reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. Verse 20 and verse 21. We'll finish with those here in a little bit. But you see these great blessings that are in Christ. And one thing you've heard over the last 10 weeks or so that we've been talking about these things is all these things that are located only in one place, only in Christ. And sometimes, sometimes you, you wonder, I wonder, I don't want to make you wonder if you don't, but you wonder, um, what are people hearing that are coming out of my mouth when I'm teaching the gospel, right? And am I getting across the absolute necessity of being obedient to the Lord? And am I getting across the urgency that accompanies, accompanies it? I know that the power doesn't reside in me. This is the power, right? And I know that uh, great men who lived before, not that I'm putting myself under that category either, but men that we admire, prophets, God says, go preach, right? And you're going to preach, and you're actually going to spend your whole life preaching, but nobody's going to respond. Was it on the preacher? No, it wasn't. Just didn't have the heart to hear it, did they? What I want to impress upon you, though, I hope to impress upon you, though, from the gospel. And what I want is to be somewhat like what Paul says in verse 20. It isn't somewhat. It is exactly what I, I pray for when I preach. And that is, in the middle of verse 20, that God were making an, an appeal through us, that God makes an appeal to your heart through me. Right? That's what a preacher is supposed to do, be a, a spokesman for God. If I'm speaking this book, then I'm doing that very thing. And it concerns me sometimes about how some people react, as it does you, and you may be perplexed. And I know we can't control them, and I know that we can't force people to obey the gospel. That's, that's just useless in anything in life, but especially when it comes to our souls. Right? I can drag someone to water and I can throw them under it and bring them up and useless. We know that. But I really want to be able to stress to people the urgency, the urgency of obeying the gospel. How important it is not to linger. Now, when I think about this idea of, of not waiting and not lingering, why is it? Why is it that we need not linger? Why is it that we need not wait? I see in verse 10 of this chapter, did you notice what he says? For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Um, if you've ever been to Corinth, you can go there now, today, and they have in the center of the town, you can stand right in front of, the, the Corinthians would have clearly gotten the message here, you can stand in front of, the public judgment seat. It's called the Bema in Greek. It's written up on there. I've got a picture where I stood right next to the one in Corinth. Pretty cool. But the, the picture that Paul is painting is not that that's the final judgment seat, but there's a judgment seat coming where we're going to stand before Jesus Christ. Right? And what does he say is going to happen there? So that each one can be recompensed for his deeds in a body according to what he's done, whether they be good or bad. And Paul goes on to say this, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. You, you understand that? The terror of the Lord? We're going to talk about that in more depth coming up in another week or two. But there's a day coming. Now, what I'd like for you to do is a, is a couple of things to consider as you stand and, and think, or as you sit there and, and ponder these things. And I'm so grateful that most of you here have obeyed the gospel, but some have not. I'd like for you to mark a couple of things on your calendar. You got a phone? Pull it out. Grab your calendar. 
Now, if you still like Justin, you got this big old long, you know, real full length paper calendar. Write it on there. Put down the day that that Second Corinthians five ten is going to happen for me. Write that down so you can be prepared for it. And as one of our songs uh, we just sang, I don't know if I'm gonna if I'm going to die first or the Lord's going to come first, right? But if if it is the case that we're going to die first, could you pull out your calendar and put that day on the calendar? Well, I think you know I'm I'm telling you to do something that you can't do. Right? We don't know when the Lord's going to come. And we don't know if we're going to walk out the door and fall over dead. So why is it if we don't know those things, what, what's the remedy to that if we want to be reconciled, reconciled to God, but we don't know where those things are? The remedy is do it now. Don't linger. Don't wait. Why in the world would you wait if you don't know when the Lord's coming back? Why in the world would you wait when you know you're going to die, most likely, and you don't know when it's going to be? Some of the words Matt said this morning, and these are the thoughts that got me, that pushed me into this, this way of thinking this last week about those in Afghanistan. It's a... It's a horrible tragedy what's going on there. I feel absolutely um, saddened by the tragedy for human beings that are stuck and their lives are being taken from them. A question came to me last week uh, about those who were deleting Bible apps from their phone and is that compromising uh, belief and, and, and that's another subject altogether but it does make me think about what we're talking about here and that is this. Six weeks ago, a month ago, ago whenever it started in Afghanistan, the day before it happened, the month before it happened, do you think that that would have been a good time to obey the gospel if you were had studied with somebody? The point I'm trying to make is, six weeks ago, they didn't know that things were going to be this way, did they? Boy, the world's turned upside down for them. Think about last February, 2020. How were we? Happy-go-lucky. Got this little virus thing going. But in March, did you expect your life to be turned upside down the way it was? Weren't ready for it. When was the when was an opportune time? Boy, you should have done it. Should have done it then. Some people got sick and they died, didn't they? Look at Middle Tennessee. We don't have to have a pandemic to have a tragedy. We don't have to have ISIS come in to have a tragedy. Look at Middle Tennessee. 22 people last week, week before, got up, go to work, and what happens? There's a flood, and then they're gone. They're gone. I watched a video of Globe just up here on the 18th. People sitting at a traffic light, they follow it, and next thing you know, there's a flood. Wipes across the road. Who, who thought that when you pulled up to the light that your car was going to be blown away in another, another minute or so? You, you see what I'm getting to, though, right? I'm getting to the unpredictability of life. What is predictable is that you are going to die or the Lord's going to return first, and you don't know either one of those things. And what bothers me somewhat is, is people say, well, when you talk about those people in Afghanistan, and they die, what we do is, because we're compassionate, and I understand we're compassionate, I don't, we should never lose our compassion, okay? And so don't take this wrong, what I'm saying. But when we talk about those people in Afghanistan, sometimes we think because a bad thing has happened, or a tragedy has happened, that God's going to change the rules. 
look, look the rule the rules are set. Right? And and the ignorant, and I'm gonna say the ignorant cry out, where's the grace and mercy of the God you say you follow? And I have to respond. Are you kidding me? I think it takes a lot of gall to say, where's the grace and mercy of the God that we tend to follow? Where's the grace and mercy? I'll say the grace and mercy is in the fact that I read Philippians chapter 2, and I see that Jesus didn't consider it a thing to be grasped, to be equal with God, but He poured Himself out, and He came down here and put on flesh and lived a life among people that treated him like dirt and a criminal and an outcast for me. And I look to Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, and I see that while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. That was me. I look in our text of 2 Peter or 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He made him who knew no sin to be what? To be sin on our behalf. He took that for me so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Grace and mercy, look to the cross. Watch the blood pouring out of his nail-driven hands and the and the, the crown on his head and the, thor- the the sword in his side and a ripped open back bleeding there and still him saying Father, forgive them. They, they don't know what they're doing. How, how in the world could I make an affront to God Almighty that there's no grace and mercy because people died in a tragedy lost? I can't do that. In fact, I'll tell you this. Every day that you wake up and you see the sun come up and you see the sun go down, you can say, thank you, God Almighty, for giving me another chance. That's what I read in 2 Peter chapter 3, right? The Lord's not slow concerning His promise, as some men count slowness, but He's long-suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Look, it's your choice. And so when the sun comes up, you can say, I've got an opportunity to obey. I'm either going to do it or I'm not going to do it. But God, because of His patience, let the sun come up. I don't understand how He has that much patience. Do you? Do you watch the news here? I try not to. You know I try not to. Ticks me off, ruins my day, puts me into a funk. There's nothing good on it. But every once in a while, I fall into that junk, and I take a look at the headlines. And it's just like a soap opera. Pick it up one one year or 30 years, it's all the same garbage. Every single time. There's no good news to it. And you look at that and think, how in the world can God be so long-suffering How can he be that patient? How bad does it have to get before he says, no more? What I can be grateful for, though, is that he says, you got another day. Grace and mercy. You can't can't calculate the grace and mercy of our Lord. And so why in the world why in the world would you wait? Of the examples that we looked at in the, in the book over the last few weeks, right? Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 3, Peter preaches. They want to know, what do I got to do to be saved? Here's what you do, repent and be baptized. What do they do? 3,000 of them obey. More obeyed, Acts chapter 3. Keep trucking through the book of Acts and see, see if anybody. Go to Acts chapter 8, take a look at Simon the sorcerer. Take a look at at the Ethiopians, uh, Ethiopian eunuch, the Samaritans. What did the Ethiopian have to say? It's almost like he had to interrupt Philip, didn't he? As Philip's teaching, hey, here's water. What's keeping me from doing it? He didn't linger, did he? He got the message. The Samaritans got the message. Saul, on the way to Damascus, right, sees the Lord. He's fasting for three days. And what's Ananias' sermon to him? What are you waiting for? Get up. Why are you tearing? Wash away your sins. Did he linger? No, he didn't linger. Cornelius, what did he do? 
Send men to Joppa. Get them. Let's hear the preaching. Okay, great. We heard the preaching. Now what do we got to do? You got to obey the gospel. Put them on in baptism. What'd they do? Immediately, they in the household went and, and obeyed that very hour. You continue on and on. Look at the, the Philippian jailer, right? It's midnight. Probably about one o'clock when he obeyed. He's like, what do I need to do to be saved? Tell him to believe with all your heart. And so he washes his stripes. They take him and his household that very hour. Why? Because there's an urgency to it. Who knows when the Lord's going to come back? Who knows when my life is going to be snuffed out and end? There's an urgency to it. And so, friends, what I want to plead with you this morning, what I want to do is the same as in verse 20. I want to beg you on behalf of Christ. I want to beg you. And alongside my brothers and sisters here who have done the very same thing, we beg you to be reconciled to God Almighty. Begging you to do it. Next chapter he says this, Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You know why? Partially because right now is all you can count on. That's it. Brethren, I, I, I and those who haven't obeyed the gospel, I genuinely and deeply do not want you to be lost. And if it is the case that you can hear such a sermon or hear what we've given over the last few weeks, and you said, okay, I, I'm going to obey the gospel, but I've got it on a special date on my calendar. I'm going to tell you that you don't understand yet. Now, I don't want to be harsh or mean. When when I, I told you when I used to teach in Russia, preach in Russia, the Russians are very tied to special events. So they would say, I want to be baptized, but it's going to be on my birthday, or it's going to be at Christmas time, or it's going to be this or that, and I would know. They're not understanding what I'm trying to get across. If you wait, if you're going to put it on a calendar, you don't understand yet. Look, if that's the case, let us study with you. Let us try to do what Paul says, to persuade you not to wait, not to wait. I hope you'll consider this impassioned plea to be obedient to the gospel this morning in relation to your life with God, that you'll be reconciled to Him. And many of us, look, who have obeyed the gospel, again, most of us have. Don't let a lesson like this, don't think that a lesson like this is not for us. It, it's very much for each of us. One, because we have an urgent message that we have to share with people. We know it, they don't. We've, we've got to share it because they're going to perish. But also, it's a good reminder to you and me, the commitment that, that we made, the attitude that we should have each day as we live as, as those who have been reconciled to God. Notice in verse 9, I love what Paul says, Therefore, we also have as our ambition, our ambition, whether at home or absent, what he's saying is whether I'm living in this life or I'm in the presence of the Lord in the next life, our ambition is what? To be pleasing to Him. Do you wake up in the morning with your ambition to be to be pleasing to Christ? That's the commitment we made. That's what the Lord expects from you and me. Do we wake up with our ambition to be that way? Maybe it hasn't been as strong as it should be. Let's, let's change that. Let's be reminded of, of what a blessing it is for you and me to be reconciled to God and make it our daily ambition to be pleasing to God. He goes on down, verse 14 to verse 15, he says this, or verse 15, he says, He died for all. Why? So that they who live, that's you and me, that's most of us in here, that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. That's the song Charlie led us in earlier, wasn't it? All of you, none of me. I haven't got that down yet. Right? But I'm trying. And I think you are too. But it's a good reminder for us 
each day to be ambitious, to please the Lord, and give more and more and more of ourselves to Him. Okay? And I hope that we'll do that. Charlie's going to lead us in an invitation song. We want to help you. If you don't want to come down front, you can meet us in the back. I guarantee you we got loving shepherds that are ready to help you. I'm ready to help you, and so is the rest of this wonderful family here at Sun Valley. If you need to respond, won't you come now while we stand and while we sing?